Hello, my name is Ben Garcia and I work at Ally Financial. Today I'm going to read to you Starstruck, The Cosmic Journey of Neil deGrasse Tyson by Kathleen Kroll and Paul Brewer. Okay. Our universe began its dance with what the scientists call the Big Bang. After many millions of years of darkness, spots of impossible brightness, stars sizzled into shape. Some grew so massive that they exploded, spewing stardust everywhere in every which way. Boom. The stardust combined what was needed to create mo more shapes, more patterns, the planets, our whole universe. Zoom forward almost 13.8 billion years to the Sky Theater at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. On the dome ceiling, the planets and constellations created by the Big Bang pulsed against the black ink of space. Nine-year-old Neil deGrasse Tyson had never seen so many stars. After all, from his apartment in the Bronx, it looked like there were only about 12. Now above him, there was, were what seemed like millions. Too many to possibly be real. Was this a hoax? A joke? He wasn't sure, but when the lights came on, his thoughts began to explode. The universe called me, he said simply, and he would never be the same. Starstruck, Neil started looking up whenever he could. Even though he lived in an apartment building named Skyview, his view of the night sky wasn't very good. Too many bright city lights got in the way. His good friend Philip lent him a pair of binoculars and Neil used them to peer at the moonscape over the Hudson River, the glossy orb with its craters and shadows. It came alive, he marveled. On a family trip out of the city, away from all the lights, he was able to see more. Sure enough, the night sky really did look like the one at the Hayden Planetarium. It was real. The sheer wonder of it all, the blinding beauty, the mysterious just waiting to be solved, fascinated him. Neil was hooked. He had a whole new goal. Becoming a baseball player was out. Now he was going to be an astrophysicist, a scientist who studies the universe. Neil's parents weren't scientists, and they weren't rich, but they did everything they could to help. For his 12th birthday, they bought him a telescope. Atop the 20 stories of Skyview, he examined the night sky in all its glimmering glory. His parents also bought him every science book on sale so he could learn about what he was looking at. Neil had one of the biggest libraries of any kid at school. His knowledge of the stars began to explode. The more Neil learned, the more he thirsted to know, but he needed a bigger, better telescope, one that cost more money than his parents could afford. Neil solved his own problem. He offered to walk his neighbor's dogs for pay. These were pampered city dogs with cute names like Tuffy. On rainy days, some of them even wore their own raincoats and boots. Eventually, he saved enough money to buy a five foot long telescope with his parents' help. Neil headed back up to the roof. Sometimes people saw him up there and were afraid. What was an African-American boy doing on the roof? Was his long telescope really a rifle? Was he an armed robber? Often they called the police. Neil solved his problem too. When police officers stopped by, he would offer them the view from his telescope. He showed off the stars, like powdered sugar flung against black velvet. He would point out his favorite planet, Saturn. Saturn just blew his mind. With its dozens of moons and its, and its stunning, elaborate rings, it was the most gorgeous thing he'd ever seen. The police officers would usually end up won over. It turned out Neil could make others starstruck too. Neil loved school. He loved to learn, but not every teacher was his fan. Your son laughs too loud, one told his mom. On his report cards, they complained that he spent more time talking to his friends than paying attention. But his sixth grade teacher noticed something. Every single book report he wrote had to do with astronomy. She told him about a class at the Hayden Planetarium, Advanced Topics in Astronomy for Young People. Neil took the, uh, the subway to classes at the planetarium by himself. He was often the youngest person and some information sailed right over his head, but he wouldn't quit pushing himself to learn more and more. Neil's quest to understand the cosmos made him a young star at the planetarium. 
the director of education was so impressed that he invited Neil on an unbelievable journey to the coast of Northwest Africa. An ocean liner was being turned into a floating laboratory to view a total solar eclipse. 2,000 scientists and observers, including famous astronauts and science fiction writers, were making the two-week trip. At 14, his trusty tele and his trusty, trusty telescope in hand, Neil was the youngest scientist on board. Observing and studying the eclipse alongside expert scientists made him feel like a science superhero. Then, on the way home, he won the dance contest and the trivia contest thanks to his knowledge of Saturn, the perfect ending to his first expedition. After passing tough tests, he made it into the Bronx High School of Science. He was a card-carrying nerd kid, winning the science fair prizes and subscribing to the brainy Scientific American magazine. In the lab, he was trying not to blow things up. In his physics classes, he was getting to know the universe. His life wasn't all science. He excelled at dance, from ballet to ballroom, and was captain of the wrestling team. He even used his understanding of physics to win his matches. When he was 15, Neil got to go on a summer astronomy camp in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. Scorpions, tarantulas, and howling coyotes? No problem. This was bliss. Days were full of classes on the subjects he loved. Nights were for observing with high-powered telescopes. So far from the city, lights, the stars burst with more radiance and in much greater number than he'd seen since his first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. It was too inspiring for words. But with his dog walking money, he'd also bought a good camera for taking sky pictures. He used the camera to bring home the galaxies, constellations, moons, and planets he'd captured on film, and shared his pictures with 50 adults at his first public talk at City College of New York. Was he nervous? No. Talking about science was like breathing, and, and people liked his explosive excitement. A career in astrophysics was Neil's only goal. Many people noticed his ability and pushed him forward. Some didn't. He often had to cope with racism. Neil even had friends who thought a future as an athlete or a leader in the African-American community would be better goals for Neil than becoming a scientist. But Neil had a, str a strength burning inside, a flaming passion. He pictured it as a tank of rocket fuel and every new discovery, like seeing Saturn through a telescope for the first time, poured fuel into the tank. By the time he was starting to pick a college, his reputation in the scientific community was growing. The most famous scientist of his day, the astronomer Carl Sagan, hoped to convince Neil to come to his school. One snowy February afternoon, Neil took the bus to visit Sagan at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He talked nonstop about science while Neil toured the labs, and then Sagan drove the high school senior through the snow back to the bus station. In case the bus had trouble with the snow and Neil needed a place to stay, Sagan gave Neil his home phone number. Neil was touched but he'd also heard many good things about Harvard University, and that's the school he chose. In college, he stretched his muscles by wrestling, dancing, and running up and down every single path through the seats at the campus stadium. He stretched his brain by inhaling physics, mastering equations, and experimenting. And he stretched his wallet, earning money by writing, teaching, and tutoring. After 11 more years of school, he earned the highest degree possible in astrophysics. He was literally one in a million, a star. Neil kept looking up, continuing his research solving mysteries. Then at age 35, he went to work at his beloved Hayden Planetarium, the very place where his dream had started. Eventually, he rose to become its director. On one day, a TV station asked him to appear as an expert. He was happy to explain that day's news about a solar flare, a small explosion on the sun. Afterward, Neil was jilted. I'd never before in my life seen an interview with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black. He made it his mission to be visible, letting his, his enthusiasm explode in public. He wanted to infect others with his sense of awe and wonder at the universe. Who wouldn't want to study it? As he learned more new things about his research, 
It made him giddy, wanting to grab people on the street and say, have you heard this? Then it was time for the Hayden Planetarium to update its display of the planets. Neil met with other scientists and looked at the latest discoveries, and in 2000 they made a stunning decision. Pluto, then the smallest planet, would no longer be labeled as a planet in the new solar system display. They decided it had more in common with smaller icy objects than it did with other planets. Neil got hate mail from Pluto lovers everywhere, but he showed that the frontier of science can change as new facts get discovered. Six years later, the International Astronomical Union agreed with him. Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet. No one has quite as much fun talking about science as Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is able to summon all that social energy from his earliest teachers that his earliest teachers complained about. Fascinating facts tumble out, one explosion after another. He waves his hands and snaps his fingers. Laughter bubbles up. Uh, sometimes turning into a roar. Equations are awesome. The universe is hilarious. Certain equations make him misty. The sight of Saturn is simply jaw-dropping. He uses a lot of exclamations like, whoa. He has a strong opinion of, on just about anything scientific, from the mystery of dark matter to the silliness of zombies. I have odd cosmic thoughts every day, he says. Wearing one of his many star-themed ties, he has more than a hundred, he never gets tired of appealing, appearing in public and dancing with words to describe science. He also pours energy into articles, books, tweets, and TV appearances. While Neil is rocking the world of science, he hangs on to his memory of being a small boy, having his mind blown under a starry dome. Sometimes when he's in a remote area and sees all those stars, he thinks, this looks just like the Hayden Planetarium. And when he goes outside, he still looks up. I don't want to ever lose that. In life and in the universe, it's always best to just keep looking up. And that's Starstruck, the cosmic journey of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you all.